Hello everyone, I'm Gemma Starr and welcome to another episode of Heart Warriors. This is a series I've been inspired and guided to do thanks to my energetic connection to Katajuda. Katajuda is a sacred masculine site in Central Australia, very close to Uluru, our sacred feminine site. What I'm here to do is to give a platform to our men so they can share their journey into the heart with other men, man to man, and uh, sharing their experience, their tools, practices, wisdom, insights, knowledge. Each man has a very unique journey, and uh, it's through hearing all these stories that uh, men and, of course, us women are able to pick up bits and uh, tips and um, apply them to our own lives, especially our men at the moment who are going through such a huge um, conscious awakening. Now, today's guest is Jason Estes. Jason is um, a much respected spiritual teacher. He's also a, a future technologies developer, and he is the creator of the organization MTVO, Masters of the Void organization, which uh, I'm sure we'll hear more of at the end of the show. So really looking forward to having Jason on here and very honoured um, to hearing all about his journey into the heart. Enjoy. Hello, Jason Estes. Welcome to Heart Warriors. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is such an important topic for me. I believe that like really going in and, and having examples and the, the the male body examples saying, hey, it's okay to go through what you're going through, but it also doesn't have to be as hard as you're making it is one of the most valuable messages today. There's a lot of women supporting women in the world right now, but I don't see very many men supporting men groups that are happening. There are little tiny ones, but it's not like this, you know, what you're creating here. So when you, when you asked me for this, I was like, oh yeah, hundred percent. This is a very important Thing. So thank you so much for seeing that it was an important thing and actually showing up and doing this. Oh, amazing. So thank you for being here. Let's get right into it. Jason, I like to start with finding out about the man, but the inner man. So who are you stripped of all your labels? Who is Jason inside? I would say stripped of all of my labels. I'm just Jason, right? <laughs> I'm a, a boy that's in the journey of becoming a man. And that process, I don't think ever ends. So, I mean, there are a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm a man. And I'm like, okay, cool. Congratulations. What does that mean to you? So for me, I want to keep my boyish charm and my childlike wonder, but I also want to have the responsibility and the level of ethics required to be a man. And that process of going into that is for me always going to happen and continuing to expand from that, right? So I would say that for me, if you strip all my labels, I'm a boy learning to be a man. And what that means is as a boy, I take on the, the task and I grow into a man in that task. And when I do, I consider that a mastered space. And then usually a new space opens and I continue with that. But I always show up with that childlike sense of wonder and also that, that naivety that is required, right? Because if you show up and you're not humble in the experience, the experience will humble you. But if you show up and you're like, hey, I'm just a boy just wanting to learn, then what happens is like you can grow into this strong man in this concept that is real and authentic and people will actually look at that and be like wow like you you earned the title of man in that moment and it's not to take away from women or anything like that i believe that women can do this too i think that women if they come in as a girl and then they they acknowledge that and they're like hey i'm, I'm in that that wonder and that naivety and i'm open to learning and i'm open to growing then learning to be that woman, that sage, that amazing power is possible. So for me, I think that that's what I'd be. I'd be a boy learning to be a man. Yeah, I love that, Jason. Okay, let's get right into it with um, in your childhood. What was your greatest challenge that you had to overcome as a child? Oof, I know. Greatest challenge as a child would probably be being a dyslexic, ADD, ADHD child. Uh, I was very fortunate that my mom was already like working with learning disabled children as well as like special needs children. So that was her role in school. So whenever she saw me in the way that I was responding, she was like, okay, I need to go get you diagnosed so that we can get you the right classes and everything. So I had a very different upbringing than most. The first four years of learning was really blindfolded 
Like they blindfolded me. I learned the sounds differently. I had to touch Braille kind of concepts, but it wasn't Braille. It was raised letters. And then like this whole process of understanding colors and everything differently, because as a dyslexic, they knew, and there's this method called the Herman method for any dyslexic out there that never was diagnosed, go learn about this. Like that's, that's the most important thing you'll ever learn about is this Herman method and how it works. And then go back and teach your younger self that method so that you can repair your brain and move forward into time and space as you are, right? Like, it, I can't wait to to have a huge platform to speak from two dyslexics about this because I cannot tell you how important that was. As a developmental thing, that was one of the critical changes for me. But the hardest part was really overcoming that, right? Because when you're different, when you have to go to different schools, when you have to go to different classes than other people, people don't treat you as if you're normal. And so I, there's a lot of abuse that happened where my peers would bully me. Uh, I was beaten up a lot. I was chased home many nights. The teachers would make fun of me. I mean, I was treated really horribly to the point where we actually had, my mom had to come in and really talk to the school and then spend time in the state of Texas, like going to the Capitol and talking to the governor to really get my school reformed to take care of and to, to honor like the simple basic needs that I was as a child. So going through all of that, like feeling that level of love and support from my mom was, was like critical for me. But the hardship was definitely trying to interface with people because the way that I looked at the world was so different. I was diagnosed as a genius when I was four. Like it was like high level genius. And they asked me the basic question of like, why does the spoon turn black when you put it under a candle? And I went into a whole long winded explanation of carbon and how it works and like the deformity of the metal and all of this stuff. And they were like, how do you even know these words? Have you heard this question before? And I was like, no, you just asked me a question. I answered it. So even at like that younger age, I was very different. And I saw things from like this whole perspective of alchemical. And so that way of understanding science was always something that was just really important to me. But, you know, in the world, that's not so important as a young child. So it led to a lot of problems. Fascinating. Um, oh, I could ask so many questions about that, but let's stick to the your diagnosis. Um, what are your thoughts around um, parents medicating children? Well, so I actually got medicated at first and we found that it was actually harmful to me. So luckily for me, they removed me from it and put me on Coca-Cola instead. So this is actually a really fun, cute story. Don't ever do this. For, the, for parents out there, don't do this to your children because it's incredible for us but it's not good for us. So what happened was they put me on Adderall and Ritalin, right? Tested me on those things and it messed with my neurochemistry and I just became not a good person. So they took me off of it, but they found out that when they gave me sodas, that it would relax me and make me very calm. And so what happened was the nurse would then stack a six pack of Coca-Cola in the fridge. And so when I was disorderly in school, they would send me to the nurse's office to go have a, a soda. So there were times where I was disorderly, naturally, right? Like it happened. But there was also a lot of times where I was like, man, I really want a soda right now. So I'm going to act up, you know, because getting rewarded for acting out, that was, uh, that was a pretty brilliant thing as a child, right? Like you don't, you don't have the other ways of doing that. So I, I think that medication can be extremely dangering. I also think that like creating systems with like sodas, for instance, can also be dangering. For me, I believe, and this is something with, with like any people that have any type of disability, I consider it a gift that hasn't been tapped into yet. I was very fortunate at a young age, there was this documentary that came out called Dyslexia, A Gift or a Curse. And that documentary changed my life because it gave me a point of view that wasn't popular at the time. And it explained, like, I mean, it mentioned all the people who had dyslexia and what they had overcome and what they had created in the world and how people with dyslexia are these geniuses that can create things that no one else can create. They can see things differently than other people, right? And so seeing this and seeing the list of names of people that had this disorder of dyslexia was like powerful. It was profound. It was like, oh, wow, I can be on that list someday. I actually can contribute to society. And I had big ideas. As a four-year-old, I knew what I was here to do. I wanted to do these things. I wasn't going to give up anyway. But to be reinforced by seeing all of these great people that had done all these great things in history and be like, wow, I'm part of that. That's okay. Yeah, I can make this work. And then not letting that go my whole life, no matter what happened, was, was one of those huge things for me. So I would say medication 
takes away a lot of that gift because what you're doing is you're affecting the neurochemistry of something. Now, for the record, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not making medical claims for anyone out there that's like, oh, he's making medical. No, I'm not. But what I have found as somebody that has experienced and gone through it personally is that it separates you from yourself and creates a fragmented self that's smaller by each pill that you take. And that's a dangerous thing if you want somebody to be as big as they're designed to be, right? I think we live in a world, and this is another one of the reasons why I really want to talk about this with like men and women and this whole like toxic masculinity and like over a sharing and all, all the stuff that we're using as words. But the only problem with being too big is that other people can't receive you. And that's their problem, not yours. And whenever you dose somebody and knock them into a smaller self, all you're doing is sacrificing the opportunity to grow. So if you can't handle someone, Give them the permission to be themselves and work on you. Like that's my best advice out there for anyone that's that's listening. You know, like if you and your child are going through something, really ask yourself why you can't handle it. Because your child's going through it. They, they obviously can't handle it because they're going through it. They're expressing in the way they need to. You can't handle their expression. You feel shame. You feel guilt. You feel upset. You feel like they're, they're creating a, a legacy problem, right? Like whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but that's your problem. That's not theirs. Don't make it their problem. That's the best advice I can give. And when you drug them, you're making it their problem because you're now influencing and affecting the way that they're going to grow. And there's a lot of other ways to do it. It's the same thing that I teach with like my people that are into addiction. I tell them like, you know, if you need to take coffee or you need to take caffeine to help you to get off of that thing, that's okay. But also create a regimen physically that helps you to develop those neurochemicals that you're looking for. So like if you're you're addicted to dopamine responses, awesome. Create a workout regimen. Also do the things that you need to do to get the dopamine, but then like build a stable regimen and decrease the chemical until eventually you're whole again. Because as long as you're relying on something other than you, you're not whole. It's as simple as that. But it's okay to work with that stuff. So yeah. That was a longer answer for that question, but go into the next. I love one. that. Is there anything else that needs to be said around dyslexia, ADHD? Is there a particular message that you need to add on to what you just said to speak to parents or adults who were diagnosed as children? Yeah, so dyslexia is simply a multidimensional individual. That's all it is. It means that you are capable of lateral thought in ways and realms that others can't even dream of. That's what dyslexia is in a nutshell. Everyone is dyslexic. They just haven't unlocked it. I truly believe that that multidimensional nature is all there. Everyone has it, right? I don't think that I'm special or anything like that. I believe that everyone is capable of being everything that I am. The neurochemistry that I have, everyone can unlock it, but they why would they, right? Because you're you, I'm me. We choose different things, but we have access to everything. We're infinite beings after all, right? So I, I think that's important to understand that dyslexics are multidimensional. I think that ADD and ADHD has a lot to do with regulation of time. So your ability to function in time. So as an ADD, ADHD, dyslexic, autistic person, I have all kinds of fun little traits and games that I get to play with, right? But I can flow in time differently, which is great. I can have lateral thought. I can have linear thought. I can have up outside, like what I call cosmic thought, I can have all of that. So I have the whole range of the game that I can play in. That to me is a gift. Was it easy to call it a gift? No, it took all of my life to get to a point of mastery where I could actually have mastery over the tools that I gave myself in this life instead of have them master me, right? Because if dyslexia is running you, then it's the master of you. It's the disability at that point, because it's actually knocking away your ability because you've actively given it more power than you have but that's not actually true it's what you believe which is why you empower it you gave yourself all the greatest tools in the world it's, it's an unpopular statement but realistically everything you have you gave yourself so choose to unlock it and find why brilliant thank you jason all right let's move on to uh, your adulthood what would you say was your rock bottom moment as an adult Ooh, uh, rock bottom moment as an adult was when I tore out my, my shoulders in the Marine Corps all the way down from here, all the muscles and nerves and was unable to use my arms and then got addicted to Oxycontin. I would say that was probably the worst moment of my life. Again, my mom came in and actually, I would say saved me in that moment because there's not really another way to describe it. So after getting released from the Marine Corps with a medical injury, right? So like as a medical discharge, I couldn't use my arms and I was told I was never going to be able to again. 
which meant like, hey, this is, you know, the rest of your life is ruined. That's basically what it sounds like. Also, like you're not worthy of being a Marine anymore, which we've destroyed everything in you so that you would be a Marine and now you're not anymore. So you're worthless. So it was a really rock bottom moment for me. I came home addicted to Oxycontin without knowing it. I was popping pills left and right. Like I was a zombie. I didn't have any purpose. I didn't have any drive, had nothing left. I was completely used up. And my mom enrolled me in college with her and started just like, as I was like, like this, I was like a zombie, basically. She would drag me, put me in the car, drive me to college, set me in a chair, let me pass out and drool on myself in front of everyone. <laughs> and then she would have study parties at the house and she would make me come downstairs and lay on the couch while they studied. And because she knew that my genius and the way that I study is actually through presence, she was able to bring all the answers into the room so that I, through osmosis, would learn. And then she literally recorded all the study lessons on CDs and played them while I sleep the whole time. She'd like walk in and out of my room, put a new CD in. Like it was, it was insane. So she got me to graduate college as an associate degree, right? And that added value again. I was like, whoa, well, well, okay, I have purpose again. I, I can actually do things. I know what I want to do. I want to be a counselor. I want to help people. So then I went for my bachelor's of sociology and psychology and the rest is kind of history. But that was definitely my lowest moment was that moment where I was addicted to Oxycontin, had no usability left in my body. I mean, I literally could only sleep and, and eat and drink. I felt like a baby again. I had lost all manliness that I understood at the time, right? Because prior to that in the Marine Corps, the only time that I really remember my dad ever saying he was proud of me was when I graduated as a Marine. And then when I was no longer a Marine, like that was all gone, right? So, and whether people want to acknowledge or not, having your dad be proud of you is something that is like a, a huge moment as a man. So that was very devastating for me to have that experience. And then to also end up a, as an addict, which I eventually figured out, right? Like that was even worse because it had become the thing that I never wanted to be. I was reliant 100% on chemicals. So it became a whole process of getting out of that. Yeah, and I want to get into how you got out of that addiction, but I just want to go back to something you said about the Marine Corps. And did you say something like they empty you of who you are to make you into a Marine? Could you yeah. expand on that and what effect that has on, on men? Well, yeah, so... Prior to going into the Marine Corps, right, I was actually in college, in high school, like I was that smart. So I was actually studying for my digital imaging and digital technology degree through, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it was actually a premier college at the time. And I was doing work study. So was, instead of working, I was actually studying in college as a work. So my high school was willing to do that as a whole plan. It was, it was great. So I got credits in high school for college. I was very happy. Everything was going the way that I needed to go. Well, well, we can talk more about like why I had to do this, but ultimately I knew that the Marine Corps was what I needed to do. And this is around the same time that the 9-11 thing happened. And there was this whole sense of like, okay, I need to defend the nation. There's all this other stuff, right? But when I got out of the Marine Corps, I couldn't even email anymore. I didn't remember how to do graphics. I didn't remember anything that I had learned. I was so broken that I couldn't remember even the basic functionality of my life prior to the Marines. And they systematically destroy that in the Marine Corps. The amount of things that happened to me that I can't talk about because I signed things is just you know, so a lot. Now, my life in the Marine Corps was important because whenever I got out of the Marine Corps, my name was heard in the White House a few months later because of some stuff that had happened. And then there was a complete reevaluation of MCRD San Diego where they actually fired a lot of people, did a whole lot of work. It was, it was a big deal. And there was a reason for that. My life meant that all the things that I went through, which were not supposed to happen, by the way, especially what happened to me in medical rehabilitation, that was definitely never supposed to happen. But that led to a complete changing of the guard in the Marines and a new way and a new stance, because the way that, that people were being trained and treated were just inhumane on every level at that time. And so it got solved. So everywhere that I look at my life, when I went to something, I got to experience the worst of it. And then through that systems and changes occurred after. And I got to be part of that change. So I look at my life and I look at going into the worst possible situations and scenarios and creating improvement, which is really beautiful. So I, I feel like that's kind of what they did in the past. I can't speak to what the new Marine Corps does. I do believe very strongly in the training that they did. This is this is something that that like oftentimes when I speak about the Marine Corps, people are like, 
well, like, why would you have subjected yourself to this? Like, that's horrible. And I disagree. You're training in the Marines to go to a life and death situation where everything you do matters to everyone around you because you could get them killed. So emptying out the personality of a person, really cleaning house of that so that there's a very programmed individual ready to kill, that does take a lot of work and their system does work for that. That's why the Marine are, are so recognized, right? But what the nickname of a Marine is, is a suicide soldier because they're the first one in and the last one out. So what that means is like, you're willing to kill yourself. Actually, one of the first training exercises you do is jumping on a grenade so that you don't hurt others around you. So your life is kind of forfeit and you're taught that constantly and reinforced that the whole time that your life literally means stopping others from, from being hurt. And that does have a, a psychological consequence whenever it's removed from you because that's your purpose, that's your drive, that's what you're here to do. And I'm not saying that if anyone's out there that's a Marine that, that has graduated and done all the things and, and loved being a Marine, I'm not talking negative about the Marine Corps. I actually think that it was one of the most important things I ever did in my life because it taught me discipline on a level I had never known. So I'm not upset with my path or the Marine Corps or anything like that. There are a lot of things that make sense to put people in so that they can be trained for life and death situations. Is that normal for today's society? No because we don't live in a life and death situation training kind of thing, right? In, in our, as a civilian, right? But as a Marine, you do. And so to be trained in that level of intensity does make sense. So for anyone out there, it's like, I'm anti-Marine, I'm not. Actually, I love Marines. I love supporting them. I still, to this day, work with disabled veterans. I believe very strongly in that. Actually, the clinic I'm opening very soon is going to create opportunities for disabled veterans to get the healing that they need and deserve. Because I believe very strongly in that, you know, if you serve this country, you deserve to be served back. Like, that's something I, I very strongly believe. So, oh, that's wonderful. Well, let's talk about veterans. Um, for anyone who has a veteran in the family, or a neighbor, or a friend, or wants to help veterans, what's the the greatest gift we can give them? Presence. That's that's like like when it all boils down to it. Like a veteran is never going to be a civilian again. Like, it's just real. Like, it doesn't matter. And, and you can't expect them to be. But they've been programmed and purposed in a way that you can't know unless you've experienced it. And this belief that they have to fit back into society is what breaks them. Okay. So actually figuring out how to just be there and be loving and supporting. And that's it. That's That's the most valuable thing. I'm hoping to open these homeless encampments that are going to allow veterans to come in and go through and, and unprogram because there are ways to help them if they choose to, right? Like the bed is one of those big ones, right? The quantum wellness bed, but really allowing them to know that they're loved outside of that way is, is a very valuable thing. And also understanding that they're never going to relate to you in the same way that you relate to the world. You, your lens of reality and theirs is never going to be the same. They've experienced something you can't imagine unless you've gone through it and honoring that in them right we we dishonor that all the time we're like hey why can't you do this thing it's like well i can't do this thing because i was programmed differently there's nothing wrong with that it's just honoring okay well what can you do awesome i'll meet you there i think this is one of those things where like men i i recently listened to this podcast where they were explaining like the whole process of, of the way that a man bonds and understands reality versus the way that a woman bonds and understands reality and it has to do with like men bond in stressful situations women bond in unstressful situations neurochemistry 100 percent. it's like the study was mind-blowing actually but the, the point is that men are, are task driven oriented in solutions that's that's what we are women are task oriented in systems so when you understand that women and men playing together is women delegating authority and power into certain situations and men honoring that and figuring out ways to do it through solving it. So if you want to create like a perfect partnership, women give a task, but not with parameters. Men figure out the parameters and then they figure out how to make the thing work. What you actually do is you create a bond. And that's all scientifically proven now, right? So in the Marine Corps, you, you have this band of brothers that's very different because when you're trained, you're trained only in men when you're in, in basic, right? Now, when you get into like your SOI or school of infantry and things like that, you're trained sometimes with men and women that, it, you know, it can be different, but when you get deployed, you're, you're with men and women and that's a completely different environment. Women are trained, men are trained, but they're all trained the same from the, the like, little different training here for women. But 
when you get together, you're all trained to interact the same, which is weird because women are not designed to handle high stress environments in that same sense. So it, it doesn't really make sense in the whole, the way that it's done. I'm not saying that women don't belong in the military. I'm saying that the way that we're putting women in the military doesn't make sense, right? Because it's completely different neurochemistry. We're going against biology and that's where it gets interesting. It's why like when men understand themselves, like truly understand your neurochemistry, understand how you function, understand your biology, you'll be a much happier person. And then the key to that's negotiation, right? So like, let's say that a woman gives you a task. Like uh, let's say that somebody tells me, Jason, that a woman says, hey, Jason, I need you to mow the yard. Well, maybe my use of time isn't balanced out by mowing the yard. Maybe I go to Bob, who's my next door neighbor, and I say, hey, Bob, I know that you're suffering with a sickness. I can go alchemize something for you if you will go mow my yard. So that's me as a man solving the problem so that the connection and the bond with, with the woman balances out because all they care about is the task being done. They don't care how, and, and men care how. So when you start to really put those pieces together, everything starts to make sense, right? So it, it's really just about understanding our neurochemistry, understanding what it means to be a man, and understand that solutions are really important to you. Purpose is really important to you as a man. Like if you are wanting to move forward in a happy way, you've got to have a purpose. You have to be able to solve something. If you're handed all solutions, then you're not going to be happy. This is not how it works because you want to be able to put your energy into it and help and, and like activate and do something with that. That's where, where purpose comes in and cultivating that is really, really important. So I don't know how I got there. No, this is great. You know, the conversation is going to go exactly where it needs to go. So uh, let's expand on purpose. It is so important to a man or to the masculine. So if a man's feeling a bit lost and how does he go about finding his purpose? The first thing is look at something in your world that needs to be solved and go do that. That's the first thing. Like if you feel lost, if you feel sad, if you feel anything other than happy, immediately look at your world and figure out one thing you can solve. It doesn't even have to be hard. Maybe you look at your 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 door and you realize that the hinge is off and you go and immediately go and you're just like, okay, well, I can get a tool and just do that real quick. No big deal, right? It doesn't matter. It could be picking up something on the floor. Mm. Key is put action back into your life because the worst thing a man can do is spend. Seriously, men are not designed to think in a circle. They're designed to think in a linear pattern. So if, if you are stuck in a circle, do one thing that you can actually do in that moment. doesn't matter what it is, solve that thing. And then the next thing will come. And then you do that and then you get momentum back and then you're good. But men cannot survive without momentum. It's a completely different way. Women can actually spin in circles and be okay. Men are not designed to do that. It's actually, it has to do with the fact that if a woman spins in circles, they're learning different angles to build better systems. And men are driven. And if, if men are not driven, then it makes them very suicidal and sad and depressed and all kinds of other things because they cannot handle it. That's why after the Marine Corps, that was the hardest time for me. I had no drive. I had no purpose. I couldn't do anything. I was either in excruciating pain that people can't even dream of or on drugs that were keeping me from even thinking. Literally, you can't imagine what happens when you mix Oxycontin at the highest level and you mix Xanax and you also have Ambien and everything else. So like every few hours you're on a different drug and you, you don't know who you are anymore. It took me over six years to heal from the drug damage that I caused. And none of it was abusing the drugs. It was all as prescribed. So, yeah. Well, let's get into that six years. How did you get off that cocktail of drugs? Well, I don't like when people tell me I can't do something. So <laughs> the moment that I was told that I would never be able to do this, I immediately sat to figure out how I could do that. <laughs> so when I was conscious, I would be like, okay, well, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to virtually do these things because I can't physically do these things, but I can virtually do these things. And I know the virtual plane is real. So how do I balance this? Okay, cool. Physically, I can't do anything. Virtually, I can. And then I kept doing that and I kept doing that. And then as soon as I had enough power and drive because I graduated, I went straight to the VA hospital and I said, I'm not going to take drugs anymore. And they said, you can't quit cold turkey. And I said, well, I have for two weeks now. <laughs> and they were like, okay, well, we're going to start seeing you every month now and make sure you're not going to commit suicide and everything else. And are you sure I can't write a prescription for you just in case? So it's like, just one more script, just maybe. I'm like, no, I'm good. And they're like, well, can I recommend books or anything else? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like I got my meditation practice. 
everything's going well. I'm helping other people. I have my purpose driven. By Whoa, wait a second. Helping other people that could agitate your wound. I don't know if we can allow you to do that. I'm like, well, you can't stop me either. Well, we can pull your funding. I was like, if you do, then that's fine. Like, I, I know what I have to do and I'm not going to stop. So over the months, they eventually were like, well, it seems like you're still happy. So maybe you're right. And I was like, oh, okay. I like that. Like, so now we're going to see you every six months. And I was like, all right, fine. Then they're like every, every year. And I'm like, okay, sure. And then they were like, we don't need to see you anymore. I was like, oh, cool. I appreciate that. So it was a process of, of breaking out, but it was a knowing that I could do it. Like I took that same Marine Corps mentality of drive and discipline and I applied it to healing. And that just broke the doors wide open for me. And once I realized what I was capable of doing, it was really easy because it was like, wow, everybody's capable of this, right? So why don't I just start teaching people how to do this? So then I started going back and being like, okay, well, how I did that was this. And then I did that and I did that. And that led to this quantum principle that did this. And oh, okay, cool. And then so then I start teaching people. And one thing that I'm, I'm well known for is I only teach from wisdom. So if you ask me a question that I don't have an answer to, I'll be like, I don't know. And I'll do it live too. And people are just shocked. They're like, wait, what? You're not God? I'm like, nope. Then we're claimed to be. I'm not. Don't want to be. I like to be the boy learning to be the man. If I have wisdom, I will share it. If I do not, I won't. Because if, the worst thing you can ever do is give somebody something that's not true. Because now they think it's true. And they're going to go tell other people it's true. And then you've just created more problems. It's just like, why? So for me, I think that was one of the greater things to, to learn is just drive is so imperative as a man, you just have to have drive. Like you, you have to have it. If you don't have it, then you will go into depression and anxiety and all the other issues. Yeah. And I want to ask you for tips that you can give men who are, you know, in an addictive state, but I think it's important to acknowledge the importance of the purity of the body without any, um, substances and that can include even benign substances that are legal or you know not medica uh, not medication can you speak to that topic please jason well yeah i mean so i run a sober organization so it's well known my stance on this but for me personally i believe that anything that you take is taking away from you now it's okay to do it i'm not saying that you shouldn't do it right because i'm not you i don't know but if you are going to do something, build something from it, learn from it, instead of relying upon it, learn from it. So if you're going to take something to unlock your brain, cool, take the thing, unlock your brain, whatever, right? That's your path, you decide, but then learn from that unlocked brain, how to get back there. So you don't have to take the thing anymore. Don't let anything master you ever. No person, place, thing, substance, doesn't matter. Even ideas, don't let it master you. You are the master of your vessel. Your job is to point it towards something that you believe in and to move towards that. It, as a man, that is the most valuable thing you will ever remember is that you are the sole captain of your ship or your vessel, which is your body. You are the sole captain, meaning that you are the captain of your soul. So do not give that authority to anyone or anything else. And then point your ship in the direction that you think you should go and go full into that direction until you decide not to anymore. And be okay with learning through living. Like I said, be the boy wanting to be the man. Learn as you go and be okay with that. Fail miserably in front of people if you have to, and then dust yourself off and be like, cool, that didn't work. What, what does? What can I learn from this? Does that include plant medicine, Jason? It includes everything. I'm very anti-plant medicine. Why is that? Because anytime that you take any type of hallucinogenic, you slingshot yourself into places that you haven't earned. And the entity holds you in that place. So the cost and consequence is ridiculous. Like, let's say that you jump over to an eight dimensional state, taking ayahuasca, for instance, but you have no principles or governance in the eight dimensional state and you're reliant 100% on the entity. Well, that's great. But now you fragmented yourself because when you come back, you can't fully come back because there's a part of you that broke the rules of the eighth dimension by not having the parameters in place to enter that space. You just basically broke into the eighth dimension there's a cost that you now pay to that. And so you come back as a fragmented individual trying to resolve things, which is why you actually see people become more of a plant as they take the substance. And they become very, um, not violent or a kind of violent, but if you try to tell them not to take it, watch what happens. Even if you just come up with the idea that maybe you should look into this, they will defend it vehemently. Like 
it becomes like this thing comes out of them to like tell you why you should take it, right? And that's how you know that they're fragmented because if you're truly whole, you don't care whether somebody does or doesn't do something. There's no need for validation externally. So what I've seen is I've seen some of the bravest, most amazing people take substances and come back less than themselves over and over and over again to the point where now I run a sober organization because anyone that's going to work with me needs to be clear in that, knowing themselves and willing to grow. Now, I don't want to teach entities. So that's just kind of where I, I stand on that. Yeah, that's fascinating. How do you relate that to the history of um, um, Indigenous cultures using plant medicine? Different worlds. Uh, so I was actually trained in ayahuasca. I, I don't administer it, but I was trained in it. So when I went and studied with the people, they said that they were, they were never trained ever again, that they were done because their heritage and their purpose, they were the last of their kind. And so they would administer, but they would no longer train anyone else. And the only reason that we were being trained was so that we could pass a test to prepare for something, which was a world project is a whole different thing. So moral of the story is, even those people don't do it anymore. And also no one does it the way they were supposed to do it anyway. So if you actually go and study with a real ayahuasca, they tell you that the other person doesn't take the ayahuasca, they do. So they're supposed to take the ayahuasca, hold the field, and the field is so strong in the eight dimensional current that it invites you into it. And so you don't imbibe the entity because you don't know how to work with it. They train their entire life. And recently we just got the arrogance, I guess. I don't know, it's normally human nature, but we just decided, well, you know, even though you trained 30 years to learn how to do this, and as a baby, you were chosen for this task and given drops of ayahuasca every day for your whole life so that you could learn the medicine properly. I'm going to do it in six days because you know what? I'm an American and I believe in myself. And it's like, yeah, it's cool to believe in yourself, but that's like arrogance, right? Like, why are we taking things from people that are so high next level, way out there and not realizing that like they trained for their entire life? Most of them are lineage based, which means not only do they train, their DNA knows it from their grand ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors. Like the guy that I trained with was in the lineage that actually the Palladians brought the plant to his ancestor and taught him how to do it all the way up through the ages. And they've been passing it down ever since. So it's one of those really interesting things where you, know, you look at lineage-based things, especially indigenous cultures, and you realize like their job was to be timekeepers for the world. Their job was to hold spaces for this year, actually. And if you actually talk to most of them, they'll even admit that. This is the time that we change over into the next age. And what that means this year, literally this year, 2023, is the year that we actually come together. So tribal societies and everything else are starting to say, well, we're not gonna administer medicine anymore. Like the real elders, because they don't need to anymore. What's happening though, is we have this pandemic of idiocracy coming out with all these people that are like, oh, I'm a shaman. It's like, okay, well, what's, what's how are you a shaman? Well, I went to, uh, Peru and I did ayahuasca once and now I administer it to others and I'm like oh wow that's scary do you at least do it in the Amazon because it was never designed to be ever taken outside of the Amazon well and I you know I, I heard that but I didn't realize that it was that important it's like everything is a quantum field and has its own soul signature and when you're in the Amazon all these trees and everything else are creating a field so that you can actually handle an eight-dimensional stable state because of the quantum magnetism that is required you're telling me you're doing it in a random hut in freaking LA and, and you think that's wise oh so many problems so so many problems but but that that struggle of like not understanding why is the real reason like we have this all the time we have people that read a book and then teach the thing from the book but they didn't actually gain the wisdom and so they learn all the problems on other people which means that they get the wisdom but at the cost of people because they lied originally by saying they were wise they were knowledgeable and that that that's a big problem because then we have knowledge that is celebrated instead of wisdom, which is what creates the society that we live in today, a knowledge based society, which to me, walking on books is great if you want to, but you fall further. Think about it. Imagine stacking books underneath your feet and trying to walk. Eventually, you're going to fall really far, then you don't have to. Or you could just walk on your own two feet and figure out things as you go and be honest about it. Like, hey. I'm not a genius, but I know this thing and it's working pretty well. Do you, do you guys want to learn this? Cool. I'll teach you. I, I learned all the intricacies of it because I lived it. 
I love that um, differentiation between knowledge and wisdom. So would you say that um, wisdom is knowledge that's um, given through experience? I would say that it can be. Because, right, like you also have the other learn by living approach, which isn't knowledge based. You don't have any knowledge. Like I have no knowledge, which is why I don't speak on things at all, other than the things that I have wisdom of. Because I believe knowledge is actually, if there was evil in this world, it'd be knowledge. They say that knowledge is the is the root of power or whatever, right? But like, I believe the root of all evil is knowledge because if you go back, what was the 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 apple or the fruit or whatever you want to call it in the Garden of Eden was the knowledge of good and evil. And the moment that it was bitten into is when the original sin was created and everything was created, right? Because a, like, even if that's just a metaphor and it's not real, which each person has their own interpretation, what that's stating is when we became knowledgeable of the things we didn't know is when we got lost. And that's an important thing to understand because you're not designed to know things you don't know. You're not. You're, you're supposed to learn things you don't know through living, which keeps you on task and, and moving forward towards the reason you came. That's that's what fate really is. But we get distracted by all of these things. And we live in a society where like, you can get distracted instantly. Everything is pulling at your attention all the time. You leave your house, there's billboards. Those are pulling at your attention sounds that are coming constantly dogs that are barking people that are walking around like it's a weird world nothing makes any sense from a quantum field perspective like you look at the world and you're just like this is the worst idea ever how do we get here oh knowledge yeah <laughs> we thought we knew better that's okay we we can do that but now what do we do now that we've learned by knowing that we don't know better anymore well we improve right so that is where we're coming into. That's what the age of truth is, is an acknowledgement of, hey, we, we didn't get it right. That's okay. Well, well, now what do we do? How do we get back into a rhythm? Well, nature is proof of that, right? What's survived longer than anything else? Nature. What will survive much longer than anything else? Nature. Because it follows the flow of nature. And the flow of nature is perfect. It always takes care of itself. Everything is created for an exact reason and purpose. It's magical. Truly amazing. I love nature. So... Oh, so good, Jason. Let's get back to um, addiction. So men who uh, have taken the, the decision, they want to get free themselves of, you know, any anything that they're addicted to. Can you please talk to those men and give them some tips, those that haven't had the regiment of the Marines, which, you know, you can see was a gift to your spiraling out. What tips can you give to men who are just starting this journey? The hardest thing to understand is that no matter whether you believe this or not as a man, this is going to be a core principle that's in your DNA that you're going to have to understand eventually. So either hear me now and feel good about it or figure it out later and that's fine. I don't care. But you're a warrior. If you do not train your warrior in you, your warrior will train through you. And that is not something you want. Every time you deny the warrior within you, it will come out eventually, usually in an outburst. Because the warrior will master you if you do not master being a warrior. It doesn't mean you have to be a warrior in a violent way. You can be a peaceful warrior. You can be the best swordsman ever and never have to unsheath your sword. Because by presence alone, you're known, right? But you have to be a warrior. Like, this is just one of those things. I fought against it myself. I tried not to be a warrior, especially after the Marine Corps. There was a whole phase of it. But, like, when I am doing things that are warrior related, whether it's just training or working out or doing something like that, that's actually fulfilling a spot of me that's so important because I came as a warrior. I chose a male body for a reason. Why am I denying that? Well, when I deny that, it causes problems. So coming up with some form of warrior training. Now, this is the cool part, guys. Like you can actually do a warrior training in less than a minute. Super easy. You don't even have to do anything crazy, right? Doesn't doesn't have to be something elaborate. You don't have to do like an hour at the gym or anything crazy, right? But train your warrior. And that could be meditating as a warrior. So all you do is you close your eyes, set a timer for a minute and see your warrior self and expand it. Solved, done. You've acknowledged your warrior. You've grown a little bit into your warrior and you've become a little bit more whole. Do that daily and you'll start to feel more of yourself. Now, the reason I've mentioned this is because addiction is the opposite. So what addiction is, is something else kicking the crap out of you. It's an entity on your back that's slowly taking over everything in your life until nothing is left. And then you have no purpose and no drive. Well, why do you have no purpose and no drive? Because you can't be a warrior. 
because you've given that slot over to an entity or an addiction. So train your warrior and do whatever is required. Now, that's weird, right? So people, this is going to be one of those things where like AA and all those people in NA and stuff are going to be like, what? No, horrible idea. Don't do that. But but realistically, this is how it works. You either cage the entity and are caged yourself, right? Which is what white knuckling is with addiction. Or you free the entity and free yourself. It's simple. If you want to stay an addict for the rest of your life, you can totally do that. Or you can acknowledge that there's a reason that you're an addict, but it doesn't have to be that way always. So the way that you do it, let's say that you're addicted. I'm going to use an easy one because this is easy, right? So we're going to talk about caffeine. A lot of people in the world are addicted to caffeine. So you're taking caffeine for something. You got to figure out what that is first. That's the first step. Figure out why you're taking caffeine. For, for that, that's important. So now at the same time, I also have to figure out what caffeine gives me. Not the reason, but what it gives me. So caffeine makes me feel alert. Okay, cool. So what are other ways that I can feel more alert? I can wake up and I can drink tea that doesn't have caffeine that helps me. Okay, now I'm still taking something though, but I'm taking something else. So what I'm doing is I'm changing and course correcting into something else so that now I have two points of reference and I can understand the line between because I live somewhere in the middle. Something spikes me over here, something strikes me over here, but now I have a line and now I can understand this. And so now this is where creative thinking comes in. So I feel alert because I take this thing. Excellent. I actually still am the, the equation there. I feel alert, right? So the drug isn't actually what's feeling alert. The drug isn't what's causing the alertness. It's a response. Cool. Now I've acknowledged the response pattern. Awesome. This thing causes this thing. That's not necessarily true, is it? No, because there are times where I take this thing and I don't feel this thing. Huh. So this belief structure around this thing being the cause doesn't hold up to logic. Oh, well, then do I really need this thing? No. Oh, cool. How do I get off of this thing? And you start asking those kind of questions and your brain as a solutionary will naturally start to solve those things. It's amazing. Once you become aware and you put yourself back in the driver's seat, the rest solves itself. Now, the hardest part of this is creating a regiment. So once I figure out what this is fulfilling in me, I have to fulfill that in myself. And I have to honor that. And now addiction is six to eight months long. So for the first three months, it's excruciating because you're breaking patterns in your brain and changing your neural pathways. The next three month cycle is you actually reinforcing those patterns stronger than the drug. Then the two months after, because that's six to eight months, right? Is depending on the level that you change things. But that two months is you actually reinforcing those patterns by embodying the solution that you've become. So if you truly do figure out those answers and you actually ask those real questions, anything that you're addicted to, you can be done within eight months. Doesn't matter what it is. People, places, things, uh, ideas, identities, all of it can be cleaned because it just takes that long for your neural pathways to reset, reforce, and, and strengthen. And the coolest part is the human anatomy is a freaking miracle. But the brain, the way that it functions is just mind blowing. Like, it's just like, how is this even like a thing? Oh yeah, God. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Right. But like that whole process of, of realizing and acknowledging your awesomeness is actually going to give you purpose again. It's going to give you drive because what are you doing? You're trying to solve something. And what do you do as a man? Solve things. But now you're solving the greatest thing because you're solving yourself. And there's one thing that's more valuable than yourself. I don't know it. So if there is, congratulations, I don't know it. Because the <laughs> only thing, as far as I'm concerned, that exists for eternity is me and my relationship to God. So in my life, I have not found anything more valuable than knowing myself. Because in every room that I go to, guess who's there? It's me. <laughs> Everything else can change, but I don't. And I grow into something greater as I choose, instead of letting everything else dictate that. Because at the end of the day, the only person I have to answer to is me. Did I do what I felt was good for me? Because remember, I don't believe in good and evil. I believe that things are good for me or bad for me. I don't judge the world because it's not my place. I don't know why people are doing what they're doing. Unless they tell me otherwise, I'm going to consider them doing what they're doing. And that's fine. But it's that freedom, right? Because again, if you cage something, all you do is create a moment of breakout. Guaranteed.
But if you free something, what you do is you create room to free other things until eventually you are free. So if you want to get out of addiction, you have to create a very strict regimen within yourself that resolves the thing that you're addicted to within you. And you have to ask real honest questions. It's why most people will never do it is because eight months is a very long time to commit to. I know a lot of people that get like three or four months in, they're like, this isn't working. And I'm like, you're just in the hard part of it right now. You're literally reframing the way your brain works. You're going to be sluggish. You're going to be angry. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be irritated. You're going to be all the things because you're changing the neurochemistry of your brain so that you don't need a substance to continue to alter it. That's hardcore. Don't think it's not going to be hardcore. Acknowledge that this is going to be one of the hardest things you ever do and ask if it's worth it. And if it is, then go for it. Because most people I know that were addicts, they did something that they felt was unforgivable and it caused them to go back inward and be like, oh, this pattern, yeah, it's not working anymore. So they know where that pattern will take them again. And those people are ready for the change. I knew that my life was unmanageable as like just sleeping through life. I knew that. I knew that, that like I would rather be dead than to have lived that life. But I also knew that that wasn't permanent because again, as I said, I was trying to heal myself. I just didn't know how long it was going to take. So I gave myself purpose. My mom originally reignited my purpose and my, my zest for life. But once it was back, I was like, oh, now how do I claim it back and make it my own? That is the power of a man. You have that ability within you. You are a solutionist. Go get to solving and solve you first because that's the, like I said, you're the only one that will be in every room with you. So get to work. So good, Jason. Um, what comes to mind is, uh, well, we're talking about men, but of course women too, but men who are in that mode of victimhood because, you know, I always feel that that is maybe the most important hurdle to get over so what can you say and give reason to those men who think oh I've been dealt you know the a bad hand in life everything happens to me it's the problem of my wife or you know whatever can you please talk about victimhood to those men well congratulations you've now identified blame and something so that's that's huge right that's the first step in any any change is to acknowledge something external so that you can see something internal and external and create that line, right? Because that line is key. If you don't have a line, you don't understand things because you only have one point of reference and one point of reference isn't enough. It's why when two or more are gathered, I too shall be there. Meaning the understanding of God exists when two things are there, not just one. So you always have to have something else. So if you're blaming something, you already know the something else. Congrats, that's huge, right? So now from here, you get to decide whether you wanna take responsibility and grow or go into anger and, and all the lower games. But that victimhood is actually the first step of the fourth dimension. Because in that state, you're acknowledging the force instead of it being invisible. That means that you're capable of higher thought and are now in a space of the fourth dimension. So first, celebrate yourself. That's the first thing. As a, as a man, you are a victim. Congratulations, you're a victim. <laughs> wow, high fives all around. Yeah, <laughs> right? Now, do you want to stay a victim? If you do, then congratulations again. And also definitely don't reach out to me. If you do want to grow out of victimhood and become responsible and actually grow into the leader that you're capable of being, then you got to start taking responsibility. So that means having real conversations with the thing that you are a victim of. And that means like, let's say, let's pretend that it's your wife and you guys are divorced or well, I guess technically your ex-wife. And you're divorced and you guys, she has a restraining order on you, whatever. It doesn't matter. So you guys can't talk. That's totally fine. You can write to her a letter you're never going to send. So you can express all the things and then you can start circling words like, okay, I, I called you this word. Well, let's circle that word because I can feel the pressure behind that word. Ooh, this word. And now I have a, a letter I've never sent that I have all these circles around and I can start to work on. I can be like, okay, uh, wow. So I'm calling you this word, let's say uh, insane, right? She's an insane woman. That's a, that's a common thing. So insane. I go in and I go, insanity is now being released and cleared from myself. And I begin to clear out insanity. So now what that means is that I no longer have a game to play with insanity anymore. So now my lens doesn't have insanity blocking me from seeing, and I can see you clear. And I go, oh, she's not actually insane. She was just mentally unstable. Ah. 
mental instability is now being released and cleared. Excellent. Oh, wow. I just didn't understand her. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Well, then I didn't understand her. That was that was me that didn't understand her. I didn't listen enough. Holy crap. If I listened more, do I sound like a victim anymore? <laughs> exactly. And now you've taken responsibility. You've begun this process because you can't fix things. Hear me on this. This is so important. This is the biggest lie ever told to everyone in the world. You cannot fix things. You can improve them or move on, but you can never fix something. And you can never move on either. That's the lie. If you have something with someone that is unresolved, it will come back around with someone else. Guaranteed, 100%. You will have that. So it's in your best interest to resolve things and to improve yourself afterwards, no matter what the situation is. So that's the key. If you don't want to be a victim, take responsibility. If you want to be a victim, like I said, don't reach out. Just go do your thing over there until your life ends. And that's fine. That's totally fine. Those people exist. Uh, and you'll be supported 100%. People will come out of the woodworks to help you stay in that victim mentality because that's called the empowered victim. And I have an entire video on that. Yeah. Oh, so I just love how you deliver the information, um, Jason. We've got about half an hour left. Now, I want to give this time to you to bring in exactly what you feel needs to be brought into this conversation around men, masculinity, the healing journey. Take it away, please. Ooh, well, I would say the most important thing you can do as a man is asking yourself questions constantly. So like, okay, what is my drive today? Is it my drive or am I driven by something? That question is going to be one of the most valuable questions you ever ask yourself, because if something else is driving you, acknowledge it, be grateful for it, and then work on repurposing that so that it is you that is driving it, that this is a mutual goal though, right? So for instance, let's say that I want a healthy, happy relationship. That's a pretty normal one, right? Most people want a healthy, happy relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean intimate relationship. We can add that word there if we want as well. But just in general, they want healthy and happy relationships. So they're willing to compromise to have that healthy and happy relationship. Problem is when you compromise, you actually create resentment between you and the person. So you actually have resentment now in between the two of you. So you're using blinders of resentment. What happens is slowly you start to have delusions around that person until eventually they become evil. 100% because you can't not. Why do they have to become evil? Because that level of, of aggressiveness is going to continue to raise because you caged it. And it has to break out. And that breakout moment is when you go, well, you're just evil. Oh, crap. I just called you evil. That means I'm judging you, which means I'm a victim. Damn. Okay, well, uh, you're not evil. You're just psychotic. Oh, that's still me saying that you're psychotic. Uh, you're... Oh, okay, cool. At least I'm not using words anymore, right? That whole process of, of bringing yourself back to center where it's like, okay, you are what you are. I am what I am. This isn't working. Why is it not working? How can we communicate? How can we collaborate? How can we renegotiate? And I'll bring us back to where we were before. Let's say that me and you are in a relationship and you tell me that I need to mow the yard, okay? You didn't say that I have to mow the yard. You said the yard needs to be mowed. That That's the way that you want to say it. Now, if you say you need to go mow the yard, then you've taken away my ability to solve the problem. Do you remember like back in the 50s, there were these things called honey to-do lists? There were, there were lists. I'm not saying you're from the 50s, but they were a thing. Like it was in the shows and all the other stuff, right? And, and the valuable thing of that was it didn't say you have to do these things. It was a list of things to get done. And what happened back then, they would actually rally. The neighborhood would rally together. This is, this is crazy, but true stories. So like the man would get this list and then you go to work and he'd be like, huh, I need to paint the house. I'm not really a painter. Hey, anybody in the office, you guys know how to paint? And then they would switch out lists so that people could actually solve the things together. And that created camaraderie and brotherhood and divine, all those things, right? So what we have to do is we have to go back to that. Stop telling your man, or if you're a man, stop letting your woman tell you that they, you have to do a thing. Instead, work on repurposing that to, here's the things that need to get done. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know that. I will work on this, right? Learn to negotiate though. So for instance, if you say, hey, I want to do this thing five times a day. And, and I'm like, okay, cool. I can only do three. Now I'm not compromising. I'm acknowledging and we're expressing and we're having dialogue. 
Now, if you are like, no, I need five and I'm not willing to bend on that, then that's awesome. That's you being in that space. And if I say, well, I can't bend on three, now we have what is called a crossroads, but neither of us should bend on that. We should describe. So then it would be like the next level that would be like, okay, well, I can only do three of these things because I have all these other things. And then you might be like, oh, well, cool. How about if I did this thing for you, could you do five? You see, that's not compromising. That's negotiating. And negotiation is the key to anything of importance in your life. If it's truly important, you're willing to negotiate because that means you're not going to be righteous. If it's not important, if you think it's important, you'll be righteous all day long, right? But if you actually know it to be important, you will be willing to negotiate. As a man, the most valuable thing you will ever do is learn to be a negotiator. Not because you're trying to, to change people or things, right? We're not talking about manipulation here, guys. We're talking about the understanding of negotiation. And the reason is because you're going to be asked to do a lot of things that aren't going to be worded properly to you because we've forgotten how to talk to men. We've also forgotten how to talk to women. I'm not a woman, so I'm not going to speak on that because all I can understand is from my perspective as a man, how we can reframe things. I'm not about to start to try to explain how women can reframe things because I'm not a woman. I don't know those things. Hopefully there's a heart warriors women version that happens someday and people that are women can actually come out and start expressing because Men and women need to talk again. Like, realistically, that's like the core cornerstone of problems in this world is lack of communication. I believe that you need me to do this thing because it's an unspoken thing that you're going to do. Well, okay, it's unspoken. That means I have no clue. Why can't I just come to you and be like, hey, I don't really understand what you're asking me. Well, I didn't ask you that. Oh, well, I understood that you asked me that. Well, that's not incorrect. Like, I mean, that or that is incorrect. What I asked was blank. Oh, thank you for answering that. That makes so much more sense to me right? Why can't we have those conversations? It's because of the delusions. We have a delusional belief of what a person is, and we're not willing to let them change it. That's the struggle. If I believe that you are this, then everything that you do is going to come from that lens and that lens only. That means that if I knew you when you were five, you're still a five-year-old in my mind. That's not very helpful. What if you're 40 and I, I see you as a five-year-old? I'm going to treat you like one. I'm going to think that you're not capable of anything. My favorite, though, is it's called, I think, um, when a man sees a woman that's sick and that's how they meet them, it's stuck in their brain that they're always sick. And so they're always taking care of them. They go into this caretaker mode every time and they don't know that. It, it's fascinating. And this is scientifically proven, too. Like, there are these different states and awarenesses. So depending on how a man meets a person is how they will always treat that person until something is reframed. And the way you reframe it is conversations. Do you know what we don't have anymore? Conversations. So the, I think the study, if I remember correctly, it was done in a club and it was to do with like how men become protectors of women. And so they meet as a protector role. And so they can't be a nurturer because they're a protector and nurturing and protecting are the same thing according to society. So it can't be real. So what happens is you get this relationship with this person where they're only allowed to be a protector and you're only allowed to be a damsel and neither of you are happy. If you meet somebody in some other situation, like for instance, one of the best places to meet is like a coffee place or something where you can actually talk for a full range of experiences, then you actually get deeper, meaningful connections and different types of bonds. So the coolest part about this is like, when you start to realize that it's like, okay, cool. Then if I meet you in a club, right? I'm not saying don't go to clubs, right? Like that's your own thing, do what you want, right? But if you meet somebody in a club, acknowledge that they're not a damsel and that you're not a protector. If you want to be a protector role because you see somebody getting hit on that doesn't feel like they want to and all other stuff, and you want to go do that, that's a role that you are currently playing, but that you are not cast as. Hear me on that, guys. You are not cast as a protector. You might start out that way, but you're an actor, so to speak, so you can play any role. So be the totality of yourself and your relationship will flourish. 100%. That's like, the most valuable advice I can give any man out there is don't typecast yourself. You're not a protector. You're not a nurturer. You're not a servant. You're not anything. You're a boy, if you want to say you're something, because you're always going to be growing into a man. Always. Some people will call you a man from time to time, which celebrate. Be like, oh, wow, I grew up into a man. That one. that was amazing. And But it's in that moment. <laughs> then go back to the boyish space again and be like, oh, cool. Space of wonder. Yeah, this is awesome. Naivety and wonder. Like, if we come to the world in that way, we're met so magically. It's just incredible. Oh, this is great. Um, for you, Jason, what are your highest values as a man? 
I would say integrity, play, and ethics. Like I believe that as long as I have ethics and integrity, so those are the most important, right? Because I'm holding that, which if I wanted to, to simplify, I would say valor. But if I have integrity and ethics, and then I remember a sense of play, then that would be the most valuable thing for me. But that's what I've learned over time, right? So I'm not saying everyone should be out there like doing that. But the coolest part, if you're a guy out there and you're like, I really want to be with somebody, but nobody wants to be with me, ask yourself if you're serious. Because if you're serious, people don't want to be around you as a guy. Serious guys, it doesn't, it doesn't work so well. Hilarious, playful men. Oh man, dude, women just come out of the woodworks for you because that's what it's about. But it, do it authentically, right? So if you authentically are serious, ask yourself why. Why am I so serious? It's not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be, right? I'm a serious person in certain situations, but I'm not going to typecast myself as the serious guy, right? Or the playful guy for that matter. I'm just Jason. That's why at the end of the day, no matter what, I'm just Jason. I have all these labels, all these titles, all these crazy things that are happening in my life, but I'm still just Jason at the core of it. Remember that no matter what, if you're serious and you're not getting the results you want, ask yourself if you can be more playful if it's okay to be more playful. And if you go into it and you realize that the reason you're not being playful is because when you were five, you were scolded for being too playful. Hey, that's a wound. Congratulations. Now work on it. And you don't have to work on this for me. In fact, don't. My recommendations are my recommendations. This is not gospel truth or anything like that. This is just my own understanding of how I got to where I am today. Yeah. But I would say playfulness, integrity is Im imperative. Like, you know, ethics are extremely important too. But ethics are a personal thing. Everybody mixes this up. They think that there's a like a worldwide ethics. There isn't. There's a personal ethics. Like, is this good for me? Is this like something I can do? Like for me, it's unethical to murder somebody. But I don't know what your ethics are. I'm not saying you're a murderer either. But the point is, I can't judge you based on my ethics. Integrity is what I do when no one's looking. Ethics are how I handle everything that comes at me. And then I come from a playful place. Because I've learned that. God breathes by laughing. So I like to laugh a lot because I want to become God. Like that, that's my ultimate goal is to grow into a godly man. So how do I do that? Well, I do that by laughing a lot because that's how God breathes and breathing is kind of important. So why wouldn't I want to laugh? Why wouldn't I want to have fun, you know? Yeah, so good. And this is the thing about this Heart Warrior series. Every man is bringing his own uniqueness into this. As you said, you know, there's no solid um, um, understanding of, of, you know, what comes through for healthy masculinity. Um, I'm interested in your spiritual perspective of the, the harmonics between the masculine and feminine energies in regards to men. Could you please expand on this and maybe men who don't have a, a, an awareness that they also need to have healthy feminine energies within them, if you agree with that. Can you please speak to those men, Jason? Yeah, so you're born as a man, if you're a man, right? Like you're you're currently a man right now in this body that you're, if you're listening to me and you're, you're, you're a man, right? So I'm going to go ahead and state that first because it's important because biologically there are real things. Like I, I can't. You know, from an energetic system, men's energy comes from heaven to earth. Women's energy comes from earth to heaven. And when they meet, it's the totality and the balance. So that's not something that changes whether or not you change anything else. Like you can't change your energy system. It's the way that your soul is designed. So that makes me very unpopular. Probably gets me canceled on a lot of things. Don't care. It's the truth. It's the way that the energy runs. It is what it is. So that being said, when you have this understanding, then you can approach that differently, right? So if men and women coming together create a balanced, harmonious connection, then what are ways that that can work? Well, if you understand that men are coming from up here down, that means they're not going to be as grounded traditionally in the masculine energy. Now, in the feminine energy, they're going to be very earthy, very nurturing. So how do they merge those two? Well, that's where wholeness is found. So if you're hyper-masculine, that's not necessarily good, right? Because you're creating an extreme. If you're hyper feminine, also not very good because you're creating an extreme. So how do you create an integrated self? And the answer is really easy. So if you're already, and you have to ask yourself like, so I was born very feminine. I have a lot of feminine traits in the way that I interact, playfulness, those things like that, very feminine things. And I also have a very dedicated masculine that I learned in the Marine Corps and really helped change things. So I, I had that whole sandwich experience. And it was through extreme. So it's like, oh, 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 until eventually I figured myself out. Now, 
that being said, if you find yourself in a more disciplined space instead of a flow space, then I would recommend the arts, some form of artwork, some form of hobby, something that you can be passionately playful in. Super important, right? If you're more flowy, then I would recommend some form of dedicated practice. And that's just coming to something that you do daily for a few weeks at a time, minimum, right? Like what that does is it creates a new neuropathway in your brain, which allows you to be more disciplined, which creates what I call functional flow. So it's not the same as disciplined or flow because if you're too flowy, that's dangerous. If you're too disciplined, that's also dangerous. But if you're functionally flowing through life, that's incredible. That's like, that's what everybody dreams of, to be honest. And you can't get there if you're masculine or feminine. You gotta be both, which just means you gotta be you. At the end of the day, what you are is what you are. But if you want to be more feminine, then be more playful and go into the arts because some form of expression usually taps you into that. And if you want to be more masculine, then come into some form of dedication. It doesn't matter what it is, more dedication. And this works for both men and women, right? So that's that's important to be aware of. As for your question directly around like how I got to where I was, like as a man, like how that happened. For me, it was really about learning through watching others interact and what their consequences were. And consequence doesn't necessarily mean bad, by the way. Like, I think consequence is just what happens when an action is done. So I've seen people have bad consequences and I've seen people have good consequences. So there's just consequence in my world. That's the way I look at it. So if you do something, there's consequence. Well, if you watch others do things, there's consequence. And you can kind of understand how society works and also understand how you feel about how society works. And that's actually unlocking more of the wholeness of you because how you feel is not masculine or feminine. It's your guidance system that takes you through life. So you don't define it as that. Like, I don't look at myself as masculine or feminine. I just look at myself as me. I'm a conglomeration of everything that has come to this point, And I'm moving forward tomorrow. I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm just going to show up as me. So that's the best thing that I, I have for advice on that. That's great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, what do you think is the, um, the main issue that our men are experiencing at the moment? What's the main hurdle, the main suffering of, of men? Sorry? Cancel culture. Cancel culture. Okay. Can you expand, That's please? Hands down. So there's a statement. I think it comes from like the, the time of Socrates. I, I can't remember if it was Plato or Socrates or whatever, but it was that men kill men women kill systems. So when something is in a dangerous state, meaning that it's in an aggressive state, men will directly go to the confrontation and that, and that they will just like go after it. Women will create an entire system to destroy the thing. And that that's a very important thing to understand, right? So men are very direct and women are very indirect. That's usually why they say that women are, are like, they, they, uh, what is it? they talk behind people's back. They create like an entire thing or what I say is galvanize a movement against it. Because what usually happens is when a woman disagrees with something, they tell other people that they disagree instead. When a man disagrees with another man, it's usually like, hey, I disagree with what you just did there. And then the person goes, oh, okay, well, what did you see? What did you hear? Explain this, right? And then the woman doesn't have that. So what happens is like all these women become an echo chamber and they build an entire system to destroy the thing. And it could be women too, right? Like it doesn't matter if they're destroying a man or a woman. If they disagree with something, their tendency is to rally to destroy. Men's tendency is to directly confront the thing. Like right away, it's like, oh, okay, cool. This is the thing. I'm facing it head on. That And that, that's why traditionally men led wars. It was because they would do that thing. But almost all wars were started because of a woman disagreeing or misunderstanding something go back into the ancient days and they always say that behind every great man is a great woman and they also say that in the ancient days women whispered in men's ears and nations fell so just saying i'm not saying women are bad right but like if you if you harness that if you truly harness that and go okay well if i have the ability to create systems that can destroy worlds and i have the ability to create systems that can build worlds just like if i have the ability to kill a person i have the ability to raise a person up and it's not that either is better or worse than the other. It's that they, there's a collaborative event that needs to happen, right? Like women need to have conversations with men that help them to be empowered. Men need to have conversations with women that help them to be empowered because we need to stop this whole men rising at the cost of women and women rising at the cost of men thing. 
And that's where I think that cancel culture is the most dangerous thing is because people are canceling each other instead of honoring and expressing, right? 90 times out of 100 times, so 90% of the time, when a cancel culture event happens, the person doesn't even know what's happening, that the person's being canceled until it's too late. It's a real thing. So this thing happened over here four years ago. And now this thing has led on my collective so strongly, and I've entered a, a group or an echo chamber that has now reinforced this experience that happened four years ago by telling me that I'm validated and empowering me as a victim. And now I'm going to tear down this thing. Well, four years ago, why didn't you just tell the thing to the person like directly like that? That would have changed everything, but they don't do that, right? So what happens is they create a cancel culture. And right now they're going after men very strongly. They call it toxic masculinity. They call it all these words, right? Well, a man is just being a man. If you don't like how a man is being, that's okay. You're allowed to not like that. I don't like how men are being sometimes. I'm fine with that. I also tell them to go over there and I'll go over here. No worries. We both live in the same world. We're both on the same team. You're solving the thing the way you know how to solve it. I respect that. Cool. Also not interested in playing with it. No worries. But instead, we have to destroy and victimize and vilify everything. And that's why I think that the most dangerous thing is men. I know that I've talked to a lot of men that have said this. They're like, I'm afraid to be myself because what if I say the wrong thing? I'm like, then you say the wrong thing and you learn. And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, if I come out publicly and I say the wrong thing, I'll be canceled. I'm like, yeah, you probably will. And they're like, that's not what I want to hear. And I'm like, yeah, but it's what you need to hear. Do you care more about being canceled or being yourself? I'm publicly myself regardless. And I get in trouble all the time. I just had like this woman tear me down to 21,000 people a few days ago because of the way that I interact with the world. Okay, cool. That's fine. That's your belief. That's your opinion, right? But it's the reality of things is like, I'm just going to be me. If I'm too big for you, that's okay. Just go your other way. Because... You asked me to show up as I am so that you can grow or so that you can go. But you still asked me to show up as I am. So if I'm afraid of you canceling me, then all I've done is do a huge disservice to you and me. Because you asked for me all that I am. You didn't ask for Jason, who's like, I've been media trained and I know what to say and not say. Here, I'm very reserved Jason right now. And then it would be quiet because I couldn't say anything because you can't say anything anymore. As a man, you can't say anything. As a woman, you can say anything you want. Seriously, as long as you're not celebrating men. If you're celebrating men, then you'll get canceled too. But that's the reality of it. It's like we live in such a polarized society that of cancel culture that men can't even be men anymore. Like we're not even allowed to, to do certain things, you know? There's an interesting thing that that uh, there's a study on soy and all this other stuff, and they found out that it actually lowers testosterone in men. So it, it creates more docile men. Yes. But men aren't allowed to eat meat either, right? Because like, oh, well, you're not a vegan? Well, I can't date you anymore. It's like, well, who told you you couldn't date me if I was a vegan, if I'm not a vegan? And they're like, well, my guru. Oh, okay, that's weird. What do you think? <laughs> right? Like, I, I eat meat when I feel called to eat meat because that's me being me. But, but we, we don't think that we're allowed to do things anymore. And we tiptoe around things. Men's most valuable thing is themselves. Women's most valuable thing is themselves. I don't think that women should be canceled or censored either. I think that everyone should have real open dialogues and discussions so that the world becomes a better place faster. Realistically, that's why when you asked me for this, I was like, wow, I'm honored to be able to share this because I know that you're not going to ask me to censor. And this is, this is me. And now if it gets me in trouble, okay, cool, whatever. This is still me, regardless. But reality is that cancel culture is killing men. The, the masculine is being crushed down under the boot of women empowerment, which isn't even true. I've seen people like this girl literally posted a selfie of her in a see-through black lingerie thing. So you can see her entire naked body on Instagram and said, this is me empowered. And she's holding stuff. And I'm just like, I, I don't understand because I know you and I know that the reason that you think you're empowered is because a guy told you you're empowered by doing that. How is that empowering? You know, like the whole feminine movement is getting more and more weird. There was that whole uh, 
VMA situation with the women. And they were like, this is the most empowering thing we've ever seen in womankind. And it was like, un, like, like almost naked women grinding on each other on a bed in front of all of the people in the world. It was so bad that most people literally had to turn the TV off because their kids couldn't watch it. And it was the most women empowerment thing that had happened on TV ever. And I was just sitting there, I'm like, you're calling that women's empowerment? How? Where's the education? What's like, women's empowerment is an educated, powerful woman who is aware of her actions. That is empowerment. Empowerment is not you being sexual in front of millions of people just to be sexual and to get fame and fortune. That's not empowerment. That's never been empowerment. I've seen like in the last three years, this major trend in women that has really worried me. And it's that sexuality has become empowering instead of empowering you so that you can be more sexual, which is fine, right? I, I believe that's fine. Like I think an empowered woman is connected to her sexuality, but I also don't think they flaunt it. You know what I mean? Like our job as men is to be ourselves as best we can and to interface with women as best we can. And our, our the job of women, I would hope, is to be themselves. So I'm totally fine with people going and doing like whatever they want to do. That's totally fine. But like, don't convince people that something is empowering when it's actually the most disempowering thing ever. Like, that's not women's empowerment. Women's empowerment doesn't cost a man his empowerment. It actually enforces a man's empowerment and a woman's empowerment so they can collaborate together to be empowered together to create a better world, right? So when you when you hear about this, and this is what you'll look at in the world, you'll see that women's empowerment is a boot that is crushing men right now. And that's not real. That's not empowerment. That is bullying at the highest level. And I cannot tell you how many times I have been at the in the crosshairs of that because I speak my mind openly and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But I also expect every woman to speak their mind openly with me as well. Like, it's not something where I'm like, hey, I'm a man, I'm allowed to speak and you're not, right? It's like, no, I'm a man and I want to speak and you also should speak so that we can discuss things so we can actually have a real conversation because that's empowerment. Let's really talk. But that's not the world we currently live in according to society. But to be real with you, the people I have conversations with that is the world I live in. And that's the world they live in. And so I think that there's this push to kill men in the world or the idea of, of an empowered man. But I don't think it's winning because I'm seeing more and more women stepping up and being like, you know what? I respect your vulnerable masculine as well as your empowered masculine. I respect both of those. And I think that that's beautiful that you're able to hold that space. And I'm like, wow, that I feel really met in that. Thank you for that. I also really respect that you're able to have this conversation with me. Let's discuss more. You want to get to a man's heart. And this is for all the women out there. Just, just listen, be real with them. That's it. You, it, the most hot, most attractive thing is not your looks. It's your ability to be yourself. They actually did. And this is the last thing I'll say, because this is, this is it cracks me up. Have you ever heard of the must, the mustache study? So if you're with a man and you're worried about your looks and everything that you believe in, right? Like you're like, oh, I'm insecure because I have this thing, I have this mole on my left side, blah, 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 all this crap, right? Like women are just so in their heads about their looks because they're taught by society to do so. But they did a study just to break this for the fun of it. And it's called the mustache study. And they put the women in, were completely naked and had a mustache on. And their back is turned to their man. And then they turn to the face of the man and the man doesn't even notice that the mustache is on for like a good hour or so on the average because they're so blown away by the beauty and the love and the willingness and the openness of the woman to just be in that level of vulnerability with them because they feel like, wow, I, I feel like I must be a safe space for this, for them to, to be willing to open to me in this level that they don't even look and try to, to belittle or degrade what that is. It's such an awe-inspiring moment to be shown and shared with at that level that they don't look at your physical features. And it's the mustache study. And it was really fascinating because it shows that. It like teaches you, hey, okay, cool. Well, then why do I care so much, right? I'm not a woman, so I can't say because I've never actually looked at my body and been like, oh man, I need to change this thing. I'm just like, wow, dude, it's still there. That's impressive. I'm like alive still. How is that even happening? And that, that's my conversation with my body. It's like, you're a good job, man. Like you're surviving. I love it. 
women, their their conversation usually when, when I talk to women, because I have some female clients, their conversation is like, well, my arm is too long on this side and too short on this side. This breast is too low. And I'm just like, you realize you're reinforcing all that. You're telling your body to keep that. If you really don't like it, then love it instead. You know, but as as a masculine, we don't care. I mean, we really don't. We care more about like what you believe and what you understand and all this other stuff. Now, I'm saying that as, as like somebody that is a boy learning to be a man. Boys that want to stay children, they probably do care, but you don't want them anyway. I'm just being honest. Like you, you definitely do not want a boy that's trying to be a child because then you become the mom and the relationship between the masculine and the feminine in a partnership was never designed to be the mother. That is reserved for the child and the oxytocin bond that is created at birth with the child, which that's also scientifically proven. So, you know, that's actually kind of cool. Whenever you're with somebody and you have a child with that person, you're no longer bonded to this person. You're bonded to the child. And how this person interacts with the child is how you actually bond with this person again. So if you want to rebond, you actually, they have to treat the child properly and according to you as the mother to actually rebuild the, the connection. It's really fascinating stuff. So learning about neurochemistry and biology is one of the most valuable things you can do because if you don't fight your biology and you work with it, you actually have a happy, healthy life. I love this conversation around authenticity um, because that has come up numerous times and um, in this as being the critical point for, as you said, for men and women to what I say, step into freedom as well. Once we have the freedom to be ourselves, you know, everything expands from there. Um, what does freedom mean to you, Jason? It's a bit more complicated because freedom is to be without limits and laws. So I kind of agree with freedom, but I'm also a little wary of it because the word freedom was actually created when the Native Americans were acting the way they were acting. And the uh, people that had come here were looking at it and they said, oh, they're free people. But you go back to then and you look at what that meant. And it was actually not a positive connotation because what actually that meant was that the free lands were the most dangerous lands because there were rules and, and, and norms and things here but these people didn't know them. And so they looked at it as freedom, but it was really actually ignorance. So I would say that, that freedom is, is a beautiful thing, but at a quantum level. I think that when you get into freedom at a physical level, you get into a lot of really dense things because we go into primality at that point. But at a quantum level, freedom makes sense. I would say that lawlessness is the most dangerous thing that has ever been. They even say that even a bad law is better than no law because of what it's always led to. Anytime there's lawlessness or freedom, physically it becomes extremely dangerous because we're not at a society level yet where we're outside of the primal will. We're still dissolving that. Like we're at we're the phase where we're like, we're moving into human will, getting close to that divine will point. But, but right now we're still in primal and in human very strongly. Otherwise the whole thing that happened in the world these last three years would never have happened because that was pure primality. And you look at the anger, the rage, all the people. I can't talk about what it is because I don't want to get you kicked off of this, this video because it's been a great video. But all of that was pure primality. That was power struggles, all of that. That's all primal. Human will is the will that works with nature. Divine will is the will that works with God. And we're in the phase of moving into this, this understanding of human will right now as a society. And I, I believe that freedom is a valuable thing from a quantum level, because I don't think there should be laws or limits or anything in the quantum because you're an infinite being. But the moment that you choose to play in a physical reality with others, it's important to have agreements and rules. Otherwise, anything goes. And if you watch Mad Max or any other shows like that, you'll notice that when society devolves, it eventually re-evolves by creating laws and rules and systems because we can't survive without it. We've never been able to. Even going back to the very beginning of humanity, there was laws, systems, and rules. For instance, don't go outside at night because the saber-toothed tiger exists. Cool. Go out at night with four or five other people so that you're safe. So that's the law. And then there's a, a rule to how to handle that. And it kept us alive. So I think that instead of trying to tear down systems, it's better to improve them. And freedom is, is only possible when there are no systems. And at the quantum level, there are no systems. Everything is infinite. And, and I agree with that. 
But the moment that you become physical, I think that we do come to agreements and laws for a reason so that we can have these civilized conversations because they're, the reason that we have laws and rules and things like that is why my house isn't being currently looted right now by people with weapons. Because there are rules that say not to do that. If there were no rules, somebody would be like, oh, I want to do that. Right. And and so there, there's a very interesting aspect to that. But that's just me with freedom and, and a little bit of history of how it came to be the concept. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that perspective. Uh, well, it's time to wrap up, Jason, but I'd love to have your thoughts on where you see men in, let's say, 10 years time. Ooh, uh, I feel that in the next three years, men are going to get out of being afraid of being canceled. And there's going to be a revolution of men coming online. And you're going to see very empowered men, but not powerful men. And I think that that's a very important thing because a powerful person is somebody that exerts power. They're a force. And men were never designed to be forces, neither were women, because force requires opposition. So I think what you're going to see is empowered men stepping up with empowered women to create better systems and enact those systems to change the world for the better. And I feel like that is naturally going to bring more people up. But until we get out of this fear of censorship, we're never going to achieve it. So that's what I think these next three years are going to be is just us stepping out as empowered men and beginning to really, truly just not care anymore about what that censorship is or what other people's beliefs and structures are, because it doesn't matter. What you believe doesn't change what I believe unless I let it. And that's what an empowered man will say. And that doesn't mean that they have to be powerful. They don't have to fill you with power or hurt you or victimize you. They can honor you in their empowered state just like you can honor them in your empowered state. And I, I think that that's what's going to happen in the next three years. I actually think that most of it by about eight, nine months from now is going to start to fall away in the world. And you're going to start to see empowerment come up in the main. But I think it's going to take about three years for the entire systems to be rebuilt from an empowerment perspective. It is going to be a little bit of a journey. But every day is better than the last. So I'm down for it. Oh, so exciting. Wow, what an amazing conversation. Let's wrap up, Jason, by letting people know where they can find you um, about your organization. And then I'll ask you to deliver a final message to men and anything else that needs to be said. Yeah, I'm really bad at promoting myself. So uh, mtvo.org is our organization. Um, YouTube.com slash MTVO team is our social media. There's all kinds of videos like this video. We're going to be posting this one soon. Uh, all of these videos are there just free for anyone. There's no ads or commercials. We're not monetizing it. We just really want people to become better humans so that the world becomes a better place. So those are some places, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I think Jason SS23 is, is the handle there on both of those. I'm on Twitter now as well. So those are great. Uh, one of my other companies that I'd highly recommend would be Void Space Technologies, uh, VST.org, or no, uh, Void Space Tech.org. Is that one? Yeah, I wasn't prepared for this. Well, we'll put uh, we'll all put of them all there. underneath. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. They'll all be down there, and that's way better for me. Uh, okay. My final thing for men is just don't worry about being canceled. On the other side of cancel culture is more. So that same person that tried to torch me and burn me down for being myself actually ended up giving me 120 followers. So, because people were like, oh, wow, this person must be evil. And then they click over and then they watch some of my content. And like, this guy's actually pretty brilliant. I'm going to go ahead and follow that. And then they unfollow that person. So that person's actually going through a lot right now. And that's, that's what happens. Anytime that you try to use your power or influence to destroy something, you destroy yourself. So understand that if you're one of those men that's being canceled that it's okay that on the other side of cancellation you're actually much stronger look at joe rogan he was trying to be canceled right jordan peterson tried to be canceled all of these people that are powerful men in the world that are learning to be empowered men in the world they're actually doing better after they were canceled so have faith that if you're being yourself that it's all going to work out and don't let female empowerment disempower you instead be empowered by female empowerment and help them to be empowered too. work towards empowering each other. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's my best advice in closing is just remember that guys, like if you are being canceled for being yourself, 
that's a celebration. It's a badge of honor, in my opinion. When I got canceled multiple times, I wore a badge of honor. I was like, yeah, this is great. Thank you, universe, for showing me the things that I need to see. So just take it one day at a time. Always be yourself. And if you're going through something where you don't have what you want, ask yourself, like, be real with yourself. Like, why don't I have what I want? And then apply and create systems that get you there. And if you don't know how to build systems, ask a woman. They usually are pretty good at that. So feel free to, to explore and do what you want, you know, but realistically, just remember that it's totally okay to be canceled. There's nothing to fear. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to destroy your life. It's not going to do anything. It's just the fear of that. That's why you're not acting, but just be yourself. Obviously with consent, this is really important guys. I'm not saying it with impunity, right? I'm saying like have consent to do the things you want to do if you're going to work with others, but just be yourself. That's the most valuable news. And it's been said since day one on this planet, but just be yourself. Men out there, be yourself. If that means you're a hyper-masculine person, cool. Be a hyper-masculine person. If you're a hyper-feminine person in a male body, cool. I don't care. Be yourself. Learn and grow and evolve and improve daily. And that's it. Brilliant. Wow. What an amazing episode. Thank you so much, Jason. So honored and appreciative to have you here and uh, your wisdom and experience. Um, so, yep. Thank you from my heart to yours. Thank you very much for your wonderful questions and for this amazing space that you're holding for men. I really hope that more men come up and, and watch this because I know that I'll be promoting it because it's such a, such a powerful thing. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And I really think it'll be a resource for these next three years that you say, you know, there's going to be this um, this big movement within the within men and our masculine um, within masculinity. So, yeah, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'll be back in another couple of days with another episode of Heart Warriors. If you could like, share, subscribe, that would be wonderful. Uh, Jason, I'll just keep you on if I may and we'll get a title for this show. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>